Hello everyone, this is Supreme Decisions and welcome to the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. Now, real quick for those of you that are listening for the first time, on this podcast what I do is I kind of give you an insight to actual, (laughs) as you can hear the sirens, I give you the actual insights of the things that differ from what we're programmed to believe and what's actually written as law. And I'm going to also give you pointers and insights and sprinkle in occasionally my own opinion, which I'll let you know when I do that, as to exactly what it is that you should know, can do, and are able to do, and the perception that's being brought forth to you by law. Now, I'm starting off 2024 late. I understand that. Please forgive me. But I also want you to understand that I do this for the most part in making sure I'm not just throwing out information. I'm making sure I'm giving you quality information. And information today is also one that's not only sourced from the Supreme Court. You're going to see a couple videos from me throughout the next coming weeks on this very subject because it's something that happens more often than not. And that's called asset taking by police without just call or asset forfeiture. Where the most part, it starts with a traffic stop where they're suspecting you of doing something. When in fact, you have a police officer making a determination about if you are impaired and or not. And I'm actually going to go into a series with Bad Cop where... I'm actually going into a Camden, Georgia police officer who actually, even when someone did not, let's say, show signs of DUI or being under influence of anything, he still arrested them. He still took their possessions unlawfully because this is one of the things that are we're facing pretty much as a country where we're using our law enforcement, where we're told that, one, that the IQ standard for law enforcement is very low. We're also told that whenever we're looking at these law enforcement officers, we're not looking at the cream of the crop. We're looking at pretty much what's left over. But we're also supposed to understand they have a dangerous job. Yet, an Uber driver has a more dangerous job than being a police officer. But most people don't want to talk about that. But one of the things that we speak about now is the asset forfeiture, and I'm going to get into that. So if you've ever been out on a highway and a police officer, for whatever reason, took your vehicle or actually came into your home and raided your home and took things out and didn't bring them back or actually didn't have a warrant or Like I said, just cause, you have recourse. And it's not always the manner in which you're told or in the manner in which you know. So, now let me go into it. Now, in 1989, yes, in 1989, Attorney General Richard Thornburg touted the benefits of civil asset forfeiture. Now, remember, late 80s, we were going at the war on drugs. Just say no, because they were punishing the users. Always remember that. But a drug dealer was to serve time in a forfeiture finance prison. Understand the goal of where it began, where the intent was. Forfeiture financed prison after being arrested by age of driving a forfeiture-provided automobile while working in a forfeiture-funded sting operation. Note how that all revolved around taking someone else's stuff to fund not only the prison, it funded the, what do you, what do you call those, the, the, the cruisers for the police officers, and it funded the actual operation. So let let that sink in. They're taking assets, allegedly from drug dealers, putting them in a prison that's financed by those assets, using the assets to finance 
the operation, using the assets to finance the police cruises. What did I just say? The police use civil forfeiture as a means of funding the police department. I'm going to get deeper into that, but I want you to take those context clues out in the very first sentence that I'm speaking on. Civil forfeiture authorizes the government to seize property where it has probable cause to believe the property is sufficiently connected to criminal activity. Hold on right there. I'm going to read that one more time. Civil forfeiture authorizes the government to seize property where it has probable cause to believe. Let's pause for a second. Because I have a Supreme Court case that tells me, again, police officers have a low IQ. I have another Supreme Court case that tells me police officers do not know what probable cause is. I can actually look at many federal lawsuits which stated that the police are not trained properly, generally in the context of knowing what probable cause is. But yet we have pre police officers making probable cause determinations of criminal activity on your conveyance without just cause. Yes, I pause for dramatic effect because I want you to understand that this is a thinking podcast. That's what we do. We don't just yap. We have you think. We pose questions to you that alters your programming. But just think about that. Police officers got low IQ, can't make a turn termination on probable cause, yet a police officer is making a probable cause determination. Now, I'm going to go back real quick before I go into that. There was a Georgia cop who shot a young man who had just got out of prison who was speeding. The guy as much admitted on video he was speeding. He yelled out, why are you getting all upset? Speeding is not a crime. The officer then yells out, every citation in Georgia is a crime. Then he shot the man. A lot of people say, oh, well, the guy was struggling. Well, you also forget that the law states, if the arrest is unlawful, you're allowed to fight back and defend yourself against that police officer, which that man did, because that arrest that was being implied was unlawful. Yet, the officer wasn't trained properly because that officer honestly believed, even though we have a Supreme Court case that states a traffic infraction is not a crime. So if you're selling me a citation is a crime. Again, the police officer with the low IQ who can't determine what probable cause is. You're telling me a citation is a crime that allows for him to make a determination of taking someone's assets. Now, what are the elements of a crime? Now, I'm going to go over this because I have I love going into this because there are a lot of people that ask, well, well how, how do we know that? Because one of the parts of a crime is intent. And that's where you have mens rea because you have to have a guilty mind. That's where intent is. That's what Every crime requires. But the biggest part of that is corpus delecti. Well, how do I know corpus delecti is one of those elements? Well, a Supreme Court case states for you to have standing, there must be a direct correlation between one's actions and the injury to another with intent because not only must I intend to cause harm there must be a follow through there has to be some type of planning and there has to be an injury speeding has no injury because there is no second party that's injured Therefore, there was no crime. And to cite that every citation is a crime is wrong. Why? Because standing tells me so. Yes, I pause for dramatic effect because that's for those that constantly ask the question. 
In order to bring a suit, you must have standing. That's a Supreme Court case. In order to have standing, there must be injury. So in order for there to be a crime, there must be an injured part. Whoops. See how all of that correlates? But now let me go back because I want to make sure you don't get lost in the sauce on this. The forfeiture proceeding operates against the property itself rather than the pursuant to criminal charges against an individual, imposing fewer procedural burdens on the government. Uh-oh. They use it as a civil action, which is why they call you defendant. But I'm going to get into that. Because whenever you log into the master class, we're going to talk about these things. And absolutely, this year, 2024, I told you guys it's not going to stay $100 for a long time. We have had some people sign up. We're now going to an elevated class. March 1st. The classes are going to begin at $250 a month, but they're going to keep going up because while the information is free, the access is free, what are you willing to sacrifice to make sure you're protected? Because when I was giving it to you, you didn't want it. So now let's see how bad it is for you, Because I, but I'm going to get back to the connection because I want to make sure you understand this. They're using means that allows for less procedural due process because less burdens on the government even though they're the ones performing an illegal action do stemming from again because remember we talked about in the Tommy so um the Tommy Sotomayor podcast Tommy Sotomayor question the first encounter comes to the police officer that police officer who we've been told not very intelligent not smart Cannot make a probable cause determination. We now have a civil action that's created by a police officer. By the same officer that can't make a probable cause determination, this officer is making a probable cause determination. So that's directly against what the law states. Now understand, we, we're not talking about, you know, people that are just completely mind dead or brain dead. We're talking about people that are not upper echelon. We're not talk, we're talking about the everyday man or woman. That's who the police officer is, but that is also the best of the police officers. Now understand that. Is this police bashing? Absolutely not. Because, again, just like I go back to the one thing that people hearken on is, well, you're against police, you're against police. No, I'm against bad policing, but I want you to understand something. Because even when J. Cole was asked, and this is one of the things I support, he stated, there are no, let, let me rephrase that. He was asked, are there bad police officers or are there good police officers? His response was, there are good people that are police officers, but how can they be good if they're part of a system that itself is made to be bad? The system itself is not about law. That's why whenever police officers tell you, oh, a citation is a crime, citation is only for generating revenue. Whoops. He yelled this out because they're not teaching him law. They're teaching him revenue generation. And see, and the more I say that, I've been saying this for the past seven years. And I want y'all to catch that. I've been saying this for seven years, and people have been going against it for seven years, and now it's coming to fruition. Because I give it to you, and I'm spoon-feeding it to you, because if I gave it to you all at one time, you couldn't digest it. I'm giving it to you spoonful at a spoon, but I'm feeding you dinner. Everything I'm giving you is heavy. It sticks to your ribs. It's the one that allows you to grow. Because now, as because if I snatch your eyes open, you're going to fight me. But if I open them slowly, you're going to be able to absorb everything that's around you. You're going to be able to absorb the light. You're going to be able to understand the contrast from the darkness because it's there. I'm not just saying stuff just to be saying it. I'm saying it because you need to hear it. Because it goes against your program. 
Hence, when I did Copaganda. Hence, when I put out Amanda Ruffin's Copaganda. And it was deleted. It was deleted for a reason because it goes against the programming because it shows the programming. Now, I'm giving you something else that goes against what you've been programmed. Now, let me move forward because I don't need to keep pausing, but I, I want to make sure you get this one. Civil forfeiture. There are stories of abuse and claims that it provided law enforcement with excessive powers. I'm going to say that one more time. Because the police are allowed to just stop you for any reason while making a pro probable cause determination, which has been told they, they can't make a probable cause determination and just take something that does not belong to them just because they feel like it. That's a power that shouldn't no one should have, right? Because you're telling me my property is mine unless they want to take it. And that's supposed to be okay. And then they want to charge me for it. I'm going to give you a story. I'm going to give you a story. It was, it was kind of hilarious. Because I always tell people don't fight stupid. And it always amazes me about the people who claim to be doing something. And, oh, I'm doing this for, I because I want to teach you a lesson. And I'm going to do this. And, uh oh, but if you're going to arrest me, it's okay. That lesson ain't, ain't, ain't valid no more. Because you're going to arrest me. How are you teaching a lesson if you follow along with the program? Because if you're not willing to sacrifice being arrested, why are you putting yourself in positions to be arrested? Because I always tell people, your actions need to match your words. When your words are, oh, I'm doing this for this reason, and then when that reason is sitting there, you're making an excuse not to do something for a particular reason, your actions aren't matching your words. You don't really believe. Because it's just like the people that follow me and say, Oh, well, you know what? Man, man, shoot. If the cops come in here right now, and you know me, I ain't going to tell them nothing because I'm down with you, Supreme. And then I watched 13 people grab the stand and try to help give me 2,000 years. I got two people to admit on the stand they took deals for something they had no idea was not a crime because they didn't believe any of the stuff they said. I even had my brother sit beside me, the one who started this. He didn't believe any of the stuff that was being said. He got him a lawyer. He didn't believe it. He didn't have the wherewithal. His actions didn't match his words. He didn't believe. He didn't want to stand up for himself. He got somebody else to talk for him. I believe what I'm talking about. I'm going to stand on everything I talk about. Because if there is no sacrifice, there is no winning. There is no moving forward. There is no change. Because again, whenever I tell people, and, it, and it's, it's also funny to me, when people tell me, oh, well, I, I'm just like you. I, I'm going to do just like you did. You ain't got a lawyer, dog. I don't, I don't deal with the piranhas. Because piranha don't eat piranha. And if I'm sitting here and I know that the defense attorney is not going to defend me and I'm not making the defense attorney do what they're supposed to do as an employee, I don't believe nothing I'm saying. If I'm just sitting there letting somebody else speak for me, I'm not doing what I say I believe in. But when it becomes excessive, what is it that you're trying to create? What is it that you're trying to stop? When you're going through this, what is it that you're trying to get to? What is your ultimate goal? And I always ask people because I do expectation management. What is it that you're willing to sacrifice everything for? Because that's what I'm going to push for. Because when you get pushed back and we haven't gotten to that point, you're going to fold. I'm not going to push you any further than you're ready to be pushed to. I'm not going to guide you any further than where you wanted to be guided to. But I want you to understand all of this is illegal. 
Because you have someone, because again, not my words. It's the Supreme Court that said the police officers have a low IQ or IQ 107 or less. Supreme Court said that. Supreme Court said police officers, because they're low IQ, can't make a probable cause determination. But yet when we're doing civil asset forfeitures, when they're taking your vehicle, when you're raiding your house, when you're, these are the people that are making probable cause determination. So you're telling me the people that can't do something, they're doing something, and it's okay. Because that's what the programming tells you. Because the program tells you, oh, police are super detectives. Why do you think so few of them pass the detective exam? Why do you, and guess what's, what's the part of the detective exam? Law. Why do you think you call a supervisor to the scene? Because if they're not a supervisor, they don't know any law. At least a, a supervisor knows some law. But I've even shown you as high as colonels have no clue what law is. And again, I reference you to Dallas. To bad police officers. Like they're in there. Their police chief is in there. I've shown you this. Because I even got some more stuff from Georgia. Because when it drops, it's going to blow your mind. Because we're taught that there's something there, yet there's evidence that it's not. And then when I give it to you, you want to argue with me about it. Why? Because it goes against the program. Because people have had, had their homes invaded and lost. Their vehicles lost after a third party misused the property without the owner's knowledge. Why? Because a police officer made a probable cause determination about your stuff. And police also use minor traffic stops to seize cash and even cars without so much as issuing a ticket. There was actually a town here in Texas that was funded 100% off of asset forfeiture. There was a time that I was stopped in Atlanta and I didn't argue with the tow truck driver. I just got a card from the lieutenant. I got a card from the cop who stopped me. I got a card from the tow truck driver. And then I asked a question. Because I was pulled over, not for speeding, not for having improper tags, not, not, for, not for anything that was, I was in a drug area. That was, that was the reason I was pulled over. I was in a drug area. And I kind of laughed. Because at the time, if you know Atlanta, I was on Metropolitan Boulevard. For those of us that are from Atlanta, I was on Stewart Avenue. I was down in Pittsburgh. That's the name of the little area I was in. I was because I was going to see someone. Right? So they took my truck. Down in Pittsburgh. Now, anybody that knows Stewart Avenue, Metropolitan Boulevard, or knows Pittsburgh. That's Southwest Atlanta. That's Swats. That's Southwest Atlanta. That entire area is a drug area. That's so if that was the excuse. Cool. And I asked them. So, so basically, that's what y'all use to take that. And then I asked him, here's, here's a better question. What gave you the authority to take it? I waited good till it was up on the truck. I told him, rip the, rip the axe off that mother. Rip the axe off of it. But I asked him, I told him, I said, and I told the guy, and it was funny, because when I asked the question, the supervisor drove off. Didn't sign a sheet, didn't say anything to anybody. I'm smiling. The cop looks at it. And I told him, I said, you're not paying attention. He said, what's that? I said, the supervisor didn't give you auth authorization to take it. It's on the truck now. I don't even want it back. I don't even want it back. Go it, 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 do, do what you do. That's yours now. So when I went down to go retrieve my truck, and I went down there with my little paperwork, the young lady that was at the yard, it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in my life. 
the supervisor that was in the little area to get your, your vehicles back, she told everybody, do not talk to him. Don't talk to him. Don't talk to him at all. I politely went and she gave me the keys to my truck and told me, just go ahead and get it off the lot. That's all you got to do. Just get, get that truck off the lot. I said, okay, cool. Tow truck, truck, tow truck company charged me some money. I actually took pictures with the broad because, she, I mean, the way I just said the broad, because she actually took a picture. She was smiling. She was kind of snobbish and kind of obnoxious. I enjoyed it. But what happened was the very next day, I sued the cop. I sued the supervisor. I sued the tow truck driver and took his license. I sued the tow truck company who threw the other two, the, her supervisor and the young lady that was secretary, threw them under the bus. And the tow truck company not only gave me back my money, but they gave me a couple of extra dollars. But I went after the police officers. And the police officers didn't understand why I was suing him. He didn't understand it. Because what happened was, since I sued him in his personal capacity, he couldn't use his union rep. He's got to now spend money. So therefore, he's got to work overtime. Yet, he can't be out in the field. His supervisor actually quit her job, went to another place. Why? So she can work. That was all she wanted to work. She settled quickly. She left him out there. And he couldn't understand why. Because he did not know. Because again, the low IQ. He's not trained on law. He's trained on revenue generation. He did not know asset forfeiture is illegal. But 95% of people never fight back. And the 5% that does fight back, 90% of them don't have any clue of how to. And the police do this, like I said, to fund the jails, to fund the police cruisers, to fund the police department, even to fund the task force that are created. They're selling your stuff to fund your, you, I'm not even going to go into the, you, you, blank. They're doing that to fund your blank, whatever your experience that's what, what you feel in there. And it's all illegal if it is unjust. If it is not tied to an actual crime, which is not a traffic citation. In modern civil forfeiture, in most cases, is unconstitutional. Why? Because it violates the taking clause of the Constitution. Whoops. Asset forfeiture is the seizure and retention of property that the government has reason to believe is sufficiently connected to a crime or criminal activity. I'm going to read that one more time because I want to make sure you grab what I'm saying. Because if I'm telling you what a crime is. I'm telling you in order for a crime to actually be heard in court, there must be standing. And standing says there must be an injury to a second party. And I'm telling you a citation like speeding is not a crime to which asset forfeiture is the seizure and retention to which the police seize and retain your property for a reason that is not connected to a crime. It is unconstitutional. And a forfeiture, uh, a forfeiture occurred pursuant to either state or federal law. So you're ready for the easy federal law. That's when you go talk. We, we, we adults. We adults. We're gonna talk to we go talk to the parents. We don't talk to these kids. We're gonna talk to the parents. We go to federal court. Right? There are three forfeiture methods, criminal forfeiture, administrative forfeiture, and civil forfeiture. Now, I'm going to break those down real quick because I'm going to get a little deeper into this because I'm going to, again, come up with a couple more podcasts on this.
I'm going to come up with a couple more videos on this. I actually have a short that should air right prior to this one where I'm talking about, hey, contact me. If you had a forfeiture, if the police came and took something from you, holler at me because I can show you the remedy. Because remember I told you, if that five flips to 10, we can show change. 95% of people don't fight back. What if we go back to 90% of people? Because see, that means 10% of people are fighting back. That's doubling what's going on. And here's the crazy part. You ready? If just 12% of people fought back, it would bring the system to a screeching halt. Just 12%. I'm telling you, let's get that other seven. Because... That 12% would force change. Why? Because then the people are no longer afraid of the government. The government needs to then be afraid of their people, which is why they're taking your guns now. Which is why they're, we got to come up with new gun laws instead of enforcing the ones they have. But I, that's, a, that's a whole other story. I'm going I'm to I'm get into that. I'm going to get into that because... And, you know, I'm going to actually get into it for a hot second. I'm going to jump back. Because here's the thing. Because even with forfeiture, even here in Texas, one of the things they spoke about, one of the, one of the candidates ran on, he's going to take your guns. He's going to take the guns from out of the hands of civilians. Because we're doing this and we're doing that. And I asked, I asked a simple question. How does taking the guns from homeowners stop a 15-year-old from breaking into the police officer's house and taking the guns from the police officer. No one has an answer for that because that's the question I pose because that's something I did as a teenager. When I was 15, I spoke about that. I also spoke about being 16 and, some, and buying a um, nine millimeter Beretta for sixty bucks. I'm pretty sure it had a block of people on that. How does changing the gun laws stop that? Because the only thing you're doing by adding stricter gun laws is making sure the people that are homeowners can't protect their home. We're not doing anything to address the criminality of those that are using them in criminal manners. You know, in these forfeiture funded prisons with the forfeiture funded police cruisers and these forfeiture funded task force and these forfeiture funded police departments because again that's their words not mine 1989 that's their words the attorney general of the United States that was his words 1989 yes Richard is the same but the rest of that ain't it But I want you to think about that. Why is that an option? Because they want you to believe that they are the ones in charge. I'm gonna let I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that go over your head because I'm gonna come back to it later. Criminal forfeiture occurs pursuant to an in-person action and requires a conviction. I'm going to say that one more time. Criminal forfeiture occurs pursuant to an in-person action and requires a conviction. Because the forfeiture is not determined until someone is convicted and is determined during that person's sentencing stage. Whoops. That's why the government avoids that because now you got a storage. Now they can't use all the delay tactics, which, you know, got to have you keep coming back to court and coming back to court and coming back to court and coming back to court. Criminal, don't do that. That's more of a Fed thing because they follow law. That's why when they when the Feds come, it's, yeah, they got a pretty high conviction rate. It's like 97, 98%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's kind of high. Because they're not coming because they don't have a boatload of assets against you. Requiring evidence. They have that already. That's why they're showing themselves to you. 
The government bears the burden of proving a nexus between the party and the defendant's conviction. And you ready for the key? The defendant may offer a defense even in that. Because even if the government bears the burden if it's a criminal forfeiture. And you may offer a defense. Why? Because even the indictment is just an order that you have that you can um, dispute. That's it. It's just a just something that you can dispute. Something to, something to challenge. Something to fight against. And that's all that is during a criminal forfeiture. Now, let, 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 I, just, just, just let that sink in a little bit. I want you to let that sink because I want you to understand where I'm going with this. The government's forfeiture burden is a preponderance of evidence. What is preponderance, you ask? A preponderance is a plethora. It is an abundance. It is without a shadow of a doubt. Why? Because it's tied to a conviction. So now they must tie the assets that they're taking to the activity to which the conviction occurred. The, yeah, the conviction occurred. Let, 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 let that say again because I, I said a lot of stuff to go here. You still have a defense even after you're convicted. Because they must prove that that asset that they're taking was part of that conviction. Now, here's the biggest one. Here is, while I use civil forfeiture, the, the biggest one, but it's also one that's used in like divorce hearings. This is why I also helped out people that were getting divorced, or men in most cases, that are getting divorced to kind of help keep their assets. Why? Because administrative forfeiture occurs when a law enforcement agency, or I'll get into that, seizes property based on probable cause to believe that it's connected to criminal activity. Go back again to a police officer making a probable cause determination after the Supreme Court said, one, they're not intelligent enough to do that, and two, they cannot make a probable cause determination. They're making a probable cause determination. That's why you often see, again, police officers yelling out things like, a citation is a crime, when it's not, because they're dealing with revenue generation and not law. Always understand that. But administration also deals with, okay, just give you, give you kind of a little bit of context. You have two people fighting over a property, right? You have, let's, let's call it an eviction, right? Most people don't understand these things called squatter's rights or don't understand what possession is because possession is nine-tenths of the law, Right? So, something as simple as changing a door lock offers you um, possession. Or, paying taxes offers you um, possession. If you are dealing with a will situation, something as simple as making mortgage payments from your checking account or from your account, that offers you possession. Possession is not test the law. Now, why is this not challenged often? Because the agency must notify known parties with a potential interest in the party. Say that one more time because I did kind of stumble through that. The agency must first notify any parties with a potential interest in the property. If they don't know you changed the locks, they don't know to notify you. So that's their first error. Because a lot of times they don't know who they need to notify. But remember, we also talked about how they're trying to find methods in which there is no challenging them. They're going in areas where there's less, less burden upon them. Let's call it that. And then two, because again, they offer the opportunity to challenge the forfeiture. What happens when you're doing a divorce? We challenge that forfeiture. Why? Because 
They have to let us know that they're coming at it. And if you have an interest in it, I show the interest. But again, you have that issue. Come on, let your boy. I got you. I can give you what you need to get. I can get you the way you go. Because most people, because again, piranha don't eat piranha. Because when we did the video, why you're losing in court? What that young man tell you? His ex-wife lawyer said, I had never seen anyone do this. He had been doing it for 32 years. He never seen anybody challenge it. Guess where that young man's at? He's in his house. Always understand that. Because not only do you need the opportunity to challenge, but you also have to do it lawfully. But the reason that the government attempts to do it through administrative forfeitures is because it's without judicial review. Whoops. When the seizure is challenged, a prosecutor must seek judicial approval to forfeit the property. I'm going to say that one more time. When the, when the seizure is challenged, because remember they got to notify you. The prosecutor must, must, because they're attempting to go without judicial review. They must then seek judicial review or judicial approval to forfeit the property. Why? Because there's a challenge there. As, as my boy called, that's the Uno reverse card. Whoops, hold on now. Now you got to prove this with a preponderance of evidence. Whoops. See how it shifts right back? We put that burden back on you know, that burden they're trying to avoid, we shift it back on them. Why? Because the forfeiture action itself is illegal. Why? Because the law tells me police officers not smart enough to make a probable cause determination. But your actions are telling me that the police officer is making a probable cause determination, which is against the law, which is making it unconstitutional. Because if it is unjust and without a crime such as a citation, without an injured party to have standing, it's unconstitutional and illegal. So now I'm challenging it because you just want to run through and just, just have somebody do whatever they want to do to you. And I'm telling you, no. That's not what we do around here. I'll show you how to eat around here. We eat good around here. But I want you to understand that. We're up for the challenge. That's why it is. The action proceeds civilly. With the government bearing the preponderance of the evidence burden of proving that the property was derived from or used in the commission of a crime. Why? Because... They don't want a judicial review. But when the seizure is challenged, the prosecutor must get judicial approval to forfeit the property. Why? Because got to have a crime. There has to be intent. There has to be corpus delecta. There has to be an injured party. Understand, in order to have standing, all of that has to be there. Now, I'm going to give you one. Wong Sung v. United States in the 1963 case. Police are allowed to seize vehicles on a public roadway if. Because remember, the biggest words in law, if and or. If it is shown through evidence that the vehicle has been involved in a crime and may contain evidence of that crime. Whoops. There, 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 two of those big words in there. If and. Or if also and. That might help you out a little bit. A little separation in there. Police are allowed to seize one's vehicle on a public roadway if. That's one. It is shown through evidence, which a police officer can't make that determination, that the vehicle was involved in a crime and. So not only does it have to be involved in a crime, there has to be evidence from that crime in that vehicle.
absolutely wanted to let you marinate on that one a little bit because, again, that one fights hard against the programming. That one fights hard against it. You know why? Because they don't want you to believe that they can do that. They don't want it challenged. Because in federal cases, civil force pictures are typically occur pursuant to civil uh, to the Civil Asset Forfeiture Reform Act, or CAFRA for short. CAFRA responded to the calls for forfeiture reform by expanding owner protections because not only about notifications, but now it imposes deadlines for the forfeiture filings. They have seizure notice requirements and the burden of proof, you know, the unlawful taking, is placed 100% on the government. And it adopts the innocent owner defense. Whoops. Whoops. Why do I bring that up? Why why is that the why is that the why is that the whoops? The innocent owner defense, because you remember, we talked about the criminal forfeiture. There has to be a conviction. We also talked about in administrative hearings, because we also told that. Traffic citations are under administrative courts. I've also talked about how administrative courts are still under the requirements of law. I even spoke on here about the challenging in an administrative hearing. But in order for there to be proof within the seizure requirements, if an owner is found innocent, there can be no seizure. There can be no forfeiture. And in many cases, what happens is you have the case drop. They've taken phones. They've taken cars. They've not logged these things in. But you have proof that they were taken. Guess what? You also have proof that they have stolen and acted unconstitutionally. And you have an opportunity to sue. I want you to understand that. This whole thing offers you an opportunity to take back what is taken from you. These are not my words. This is the C-A-F-R-A. Read it yourself. That's why I give you these. I'm not just talking. Because individual states have taken as much as $46 million in a single year from this practice. Why? Because forfeiture is big business. Again, I spoke about many small towns surviving off the funds of illegal forfeiture. I spoke about the town here in Texas. If you go back to the um, shutdown, look at the amount of small cities that almost collapsed. Many of them went without a police force for two years or more. There are a couple that are still without police forces. Why? Because they are funded through civil forfeiture. And generally it's funded through forfeiting assets of people that do not live in that town. Don't worry about it. I'm going to let that sink in. Because a lot of people don't understand that targeting exists. Even out-of-towners are targeted. Why? Because you're more apropos for the inconvenience to pay the fines to pay for the reckless behavior of the police officers in the police department so you can continue getting your stuff and go back home through their illegal extortion activities. And again, not my words. That's the reason this was set up. These aren't my words. I wish they were. This is actual law. Why? Because these are things that are actually happening. Because forfeiture is the attractive tool for law enforcement. Why? 1989. The United States Attorney General to fund prisons, to fund police cruises, to fund police initiatives, to fund police departments. Listen. 
Let me know when I'm bashing. Just, 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 I'm going to throw it out there. Let me know. Because I'm repeating what the United States Attorney General said in 1986. I mean, 89. So whenever I'm telling you certain things are happening, and then I show you certain things are happening, and you're still arguing with me about these things that are happening, why aren't you arguing with me about the exact happenings of it? Because I'm showing it to you. Because we get real silent when we see it. Or my favorite is when it happens to you. Oh yeah, I, I, I let the crickets run on that one. Because it's about revenue. It's never about law. Which is why police officers are not trained in law. But escalation and revenue generation tactics. And many people don't know how to or even wish to fight. They accept it as par for the course. Or they'll pay because of the inconvenience. Why? Because it's an attractive tool for law enforcement. To why? Fund prisons. To fund police cruises. To fund police departments. To the fund police initiatives. It's an attractive tool. Understand that. Because they don't want you. They don't want the burden. Give them back the burden. Give them back the burden. That's all you have to do. Officials often use prosecutorial tactics. Uh-oh. I'm going to say that one more time because I, I, I hear people say, oh, well, the prosecutor don't do that. Everybody that's in prison deserve to be there. Officials often use prosecutorial tactics to obtain forfeitures, subjecting individuals to criminal enforcement practices without the corresponding criminal procedure protections. Why? Because they don't want the burden. They'll throw you in jail, take your car, and have you sit there. Don't give you a bond because they'll hold you for the 72 hours. Then they'll just, they'll, as one police officer said, we'll figure it out. We'll figure out something just to charge you with. Why? Because now you got to come up with money because of their forfeiture. Why? Because of these inconveniences that they're offering you. Highway interdictions use minor traffic violations as a pretext for vehicle stops. Remember I told you. I was in a drug area. That's why they stopped me. This man was speeding. Now, that's not minor, but I get it. But he's on 20. I don't know anybody on 20 that's not speeding. But I'll get that. That's not here nor there, but it's okay. It's good. You know, because he knew he was speeding. He was like, you know what? Just write the ticket. I'm good. I'll fight it and go it, whatever. Now, these stops rarely result in criminal penalties. But produce criminal or civil forfeitures based on the drivers appearing nervous or possessing large amounts of cash. I'm going to say that one more time. These stops rarely result in criminal penalties, but produce civil forfeitures based on a driver appearing nervous. Now, I want you to think about something. Did a, did a podcast about a bad officer, Blake Simmons. And I did it because Blake Simmons was very nice and at points he seemed professional. But what did he do? He did an illegal search and seizure. Soon as his supervisor came, he lied and said, oh yeah, he's, he's acting nervous. He's acting nervous. He, he's shaking a lot. After he had already noted it was 42 degrees and raining outside. Which he wanted the young man to get out the conveyance and stand in the rain in 42 degree weather. But he was shaking because he was nervous, right? Not because it was 42 degrees and raining. Got it. These are the methods that are used because, again, there was no criminal penalty. But it produced a civil action. 
which now is in federal court. Why? Because Blake Simmons is a bad officer. Because even Officer Johnson, oh, uh, Officer Simmons does this all the time. So why? Because the forfeiture action is funding that task force. Whoops. Whoops. I'm going to say that one more time. Because the forfeiture actions that Blake Simmons is involved in is funding the task force Blake Simmons is a part of. Whoops. Whoops. I want you to understand that. Police and district attorneys also collaborate to seize non-local drivers. Uh oh, I'm going to say that one more time. Because we even talked about that in Arizona. Remember Jerry Williams? And I spoke about how she lied and made people gang members and took their stuff and uh-oh, uh-oh. The Thomas Sotomayor question. You've got to listen to that podcast. Police and district attorneys also collaborate to seize non-local drivers' property and pressure them into waiving their property claims in exchange for a non-prosecutorial agreement or a cash-for-freedom deal. Even when these threats of criminal charges include felonies and are unsubstantiated. You know, like when Jerry Williams told a prosecutor who was disbarred that they were in collaborations with these people are gang members. That's why we're taking them and putting them in jail and taking their stuff. Made them gang members. Even though that was unsubstantiated. What I talked about was non-local drivers putting pressure on them for freedom. These are the deals that I'm talking about. The exchange for cash. The convenience of going on with your stuff even though you've done nothing illegal. Now, Here's another beast. The Internal Revenue Service has relied on the third party doctrine in its civil forfeitures to comb through bank accounts and seize accounts of individuals suspected of structuring without even charging a crime. The IRS, I've actually seen them do it. No crime, no wherewithal of any activity. They just go get into your accounts and keep it. That's what they do. Many police budgets depend on forfeiture revenue to fund crime-fighting equipment, salaries, and even officer bonus. You remember when we spoke about, as well, I spoke about the quotas that police officers have. Had a lot of people in the comments arguing, had a lot of emails arguing with me. Yo, please don't have quotas, please don't have quotas. Trevor Noah then did a show. I reposted Trevor Noah's show. All of a sudden, my video gets deleted and I got to post it on another platform and all these good stuff. But I thought they didn't have quotas. Had another police officer go on CNN and spoke about his quotas. He even spoke about the quotas he had per minority group. But again, I'm, I'm told that doesn't happen, right? But this is done through these assets of taking. Because again, those quotas offer officer bonuses. Because you remember I told you that asset forfeitures also fund police departments. What I mean by police departments? Salaries. Their, their budgets or their payments are done out through the forfeiture. How much forfeiture? One city did forty-six million in a in a calendar year. Forty-six million. One city. That's a lot of forfeitures. And in some Texas county, forfeitures fund nearly forty percent of police budgets. I'm gonna say that one more time because I, I I actually just said that. I literally just said some Texas counties, 
Forfeitures fund nearly 40% of police budgets. Remember I talked about the little town? It's, it's, it's down here. It's between here and Dallas. It's between here and Dallas. 40% of that police department's budgets. And drivers, because this happened even during my case, drivers possess large sums of money for innocent reasons, but officers assume a relationship to drug activity for seizure purposes. Yet, it's unsubstantiated. Why? Because police officers don't know what probable cause is. That's why they make a lot of assumptions and just say stuff. And when you, they figure if you, they call you a name, you can, you're going to get out of character, which allows them to generate revenue. That's why a lot of them, whenever they stop me, they tell me, it's, it, you, you're really odd because you're smiling. And I always tell them the same thing. Why would I get upset with somebody that's about to hand me money? I'm not getting upset with somebody that's about to give me money. Even when they arrest me. No, no, I'm going. Let's go. I'm going to take them to the house. Because, see, you need, my, you need a judge's permission to get my fingerprints. Davis v. Mississippi. Because if you force ID me, I'm going to tap those pockets. You transport me more than in three feet against my will, I'm going to tap them pockets. Because ignorance of the law is not your forte. You have a duty to work towards my benefit. Why? Because you had that oath of office. You are fiduciary. You are put in a position of servitude. Whether you accept it, that's your business. If you choose not to show that you are intelligent enough to, I get to sue you due to the incompetence and I can take your policing license. Why am I upset with you for doing stupid shit? I'm getting you out the way. You're a pawn. I'm moving you off the board. A king don't get upset with pawns. He removes them from the board. And I use every tool at my, at my disposal to the maximum effect that it has. I don't worry about the rest of that. Why? Because I believe what I'm saying. I live it. I breathe it. I don't pretend to do this. I'm not just talking. My actions match my words. When I tell you I am willing to look the devil in his face, open up. Give me, give me a fight date. Show me the arena. I'm ready to go. I train for this every day. What are you doing? I will push all my chips to the middle of the table. And it's even worse now. I'm, I was bad back then because I was reckless. I was angry. Now I'm calculating and I'm angry because all I want to be is left alone. That's all you got to do. Leave me alone. But I will put the undefeated record on the line if you cho choose to step up because the only way you beat me is if you steal it from me. And if you steal it from me, I'm going to take everything you believe you love. That's why I don't worry about the forfeitures. I don't worry about because you can't change stupid. You can't trade ignorance. I'm going to remain calm in the midst of all this foolishness. You do what you need to do because I'm damn sure doing what I'm going to need to do. And when I do it, there's no reason for you because I'm going to give you, again, this is war. I'm going to give you an opportunity to back out. But if you choose to come forward, I am going to destroy you. Always understand that. If you go after an enemy, go after them wholly and to destroy them. I don't want you coming back. And if I have to destroy you and everybody that looks like you, I am cool with that as well. Because just like I told a friend of mine, an eye for an eye, we both lose our sight. What if I'm willing to lose that eye to take yours? If I'm willing to lose it, I am taking yours. Because I'm going to take everything you believe you love. Or you can leave me alone.
Always understand that because I understand this at a different level. Hell, my brother's attorney said as much, which is why I sat first chair during my RICO trial. I understand this at a different level. I go through this law at a different level. I'm not doing this just to be good. I am doing this to be left alone. So I am doing this to be great. I don't have to go out in the spotlight. I don't need spotlight. Because, uh, matter of fact, just treat me like I don't need the spotlight because I already got light. I want you to understand that I'm coming. And I'm giving you this because I'm letting you know there is a way out if you're willing to walk through the fire. Because whenever I started this, one of the things that was funny to me was how people would tell me you shouldn't do that because the police officers are good people. They're well intended, blah, 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 blah. Right. But they were the same people to tell me you might want to watch out for those good people that are well intended. The oxymoron. That the good people were the ones that was going to hurt me. Not the criminals, but the cops. Not the criminals, but the prosecutors. Not the criminals, but the judges. I always understand. And I, I, I laugh at it because the level of delusion. You're willing to accept foolery instead of standing on your own when you know it's wrong. Because even, again, I speak about those that are that I call police apologists. Blind loyalty isn't loyalty. Because all you're doing is crippling the person that you're supporting when you're not correcting them. These are the contexts in which I want to give everybody. Because, again, a lot of people want to argue with me. I get it. I get it because I'm going against your, your program. You want to you wanna tell me how it is and what it really do. Yeah. If you want to do that, show it to me. Put it up on your channel and tag me in your video. Because I have a method in which I'm using this. Because again, like I said, if you go back to a video I did five years ago, I said I was going to do a thousand videos. I'm only halfway there. I'm a little more than halfway there. All right, I still got another 400 videos to go. Bare minimum. I said this five years ago. Understand, I haven't given you everything that I got. I haven't given you the best of me yet. But I want you to understand if you're going to keep walking. Keep walking. Stay focused. Listen to exactly what it is that I'm saying. Now, law enforcement officials have also spent them on extravagance like expensive dinners, parties, and personal expenses. You remember funding the police department and police functions. That will be a police function. Salaries. The decision to pursue a forfeiture is offering government not by justice, but by the department wish list. So even though it's a governmental action, it's generally not pursued based on law. It's pursued on that 40% police budget or police wish list. Because here's what, again, remember I told you, they're not trained on law, they're trained on escalation tactics and revenue generation. Why? Because police forfeiture training includes, whoa, uh -oh, Remember, one of the key things that's used when you're suing a police officer is not trained properly. Remember, civil forfeiture training includes maximizing profits, defeating the objections of so-called innocent owners, and keeping the proceeds in the hands of law enforcement. Mm, 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 mm. 
Well, I want to make sure you listen. Did, did you pay attention to that one? Maximizing profits, defeating objectives of so-called innocent owner. So does that mean that innocent are proven guilty? Probably not. We go, well, let, me, let me go ahead. U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Asset Forfeiture Handbook similarly emphasizes profit maximization as central in forfeiture decision. I'm gonna, immigration and Customs, their forfeiture handbook emphasizes maximizing profits in forfeiture decisions. The handbook outlines six key factors agents should consider. Four. Remember, hold on. They have six <laughs> key factors agents should consider. Four involve how much a property is worth. Asset forfeiture in law enforcement is big business. Police wish list. It's about. <laughs> it's about revenue generation. Not. Law. Which is why many of them don't know law. And they shout out foolish stuff like. Citations are crimes. When they don't have standing. Equitable sharing allows forfeiture. Uh, <laughs> equitable sharing allows federal rather than state to ream produce procedures to govern property seizure by state or local authorities. Okay, here we go. Let me let me slow down because I, one I screwed that up. Two, I want to give you kind of a context. Equitable sharing. Allows federal rather than state in REM procedures to govern property seized by state or local authorities. Now, this is something that I saw literally in Gwinnett County, Georgia. You will see that this is a joint de designation on the side of the jail that Young Thug was held in. On the upper right corner, when you're turning in, there's a designation that says that is a federal seizure or asset funded facility. If you go down to Rice Street in Fulton County, you will see that it is a federal asset funded facility, which is why. Asset forfeiture is big business in Atlanta, which is why they also employed third-party parking enforcement. I'll get into that because they had that once before. We got it stopped, and they started it back, and I saw it was, it was kind of neat. But they're using same people, same properties, same trucks, just different names. That's it. Because the devil never changes his tactics. Always understand it. He stuck with one move. Change the name, do it again. But anyway, but what happens in these type of forfeitures or for, for these facilities to exist, it occurs when a state or local authority turns over seized property to a federal agency for adoption or works with the agency on a joint task force or investigation. The state or local entity is then eligible to receive up to 80% of the forfeited proceeds. Now, I'm going to give you something because Miss Fanny Willis has been in the news lately. So let's go ahead and, you know, kick her again while she's down. You know, because that's the best time because she's close to your feet. But Fanny Willis charged this federal agent. Well, actually, he wasn't a federal agent. I apologize. He was working on a federal task force. And he shot this young man five years ago, and killed him execution style. He was charged with murder. He actually just, he was working up until last year. She still has not taken him to court. Oh yes, 
He was a police officer. Yeah, did, did I fail to mention that? The young man he killed, he killed while he was laying down with his hands out. He was killed execution style. Yes, this police officer killed this. Actually, I believe it was Hutchinson. Because about two weeks after I put out the video, um, uh, I believe it was TYT actually did a story on it. And then a couple weeks, about a week after that, he was then laid off. But he still was not taken to trial. Let that sink in. But Fanny spoke about how she was going to be tough on crime. And she used a federal task force to execute a young man and take his stuff. They did that similarly with another young man that was supposed to be a part of this YSL trial. He had turned himself in with his father. And then the next day, this task force went out there and executed him in his own home. Fannie Willis was okay with it because they then seized cash from out of this young man's house that his parents had. They had nothing to do with the young man or the reason that they were there. But they seized things out of this man's house. And Fannie Willis was okay with it because Fannie Willis benefited from it, not as a person, but her department because there's an 80% receiving of the forfeited proceeds. Why? Because there was a federal agent there, so they were working in a joint task force. Oh, let that sink in. I want you to understand how this works. Because a lot of times it seems as if I'm talking or I'm venting or I'm mad. I'm reading. But I'm also giving you those examples because you don't have to take my word for it. These things were in the newspaper. These were on TV. These, were, these made it to CNN. You don't have to take my word for it. But these are the easies. Right? I want you to understand that this exists. Because whenever we're doing this, it's not only to educate you about the now, it's to educate you about forever because it's educating not only yourself but your children and your grandchildren and your great grand but it's to make sure we understand to start standing up for ourselves stop believing everything just because somebody told you to believe it because you're told to do something who told them who got them there that's probably where all the they come from. Where, where, where they at? Can I see they? Because I need to talk to they. Because I'm reading these books that tell me the exact opposite of what they're supposed to be doing. Because their actions aren't matching their words. Oh, I'm going to serve and protect after I kick you in the head and shoot you for no reason. Or after you're in a car accident... You're going to have to be able to move at my command even though I haven't figured out there's a crime because I haven't even followed my own procedures of a totality of circumstances even talk to the person that complained. But I'm going to get into that. Those are things that, that we're going to do because these people don't make mistakes. At least that's what they tell me. No mistakes seen here. At least that's what they tell me. But here's, here's the easy. All right? Eric Holder imposed some limits on the program in 2015. More than 42% of the police departments and task force in the United States of America in 2015 participated in asset sharing with the feds. I'm going to say that one more time. Eric Holder in 2015 imposed limits to the program. More than 42% of all police departments in the United States and task force were participating. Hundreds received more than 20% or more from these forfeit as part of their annual budget. More than 20% and 42% of all police departments. 
This is yet another sign that you need to start fighting in court. Because federal law is what governs even state forfeitures. Because if they're partnering with the feds and they're not doing it properly, why? Because you have police officers that can't make probable cause determination, making a probable cause determination, and then reaping 80% of the, uh-oh, doesn't that sound like extortion? Doesn't that sound like RICO? Doesn't that sound like conspiracy? Because the police chief and the DA are partners. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let that one fly over your head too, because civil forfeiture violates due process clause. Civil forfeiture violate the taking clause. And, and, and you, hear, you ready for the last part? I'm gonna give you this one again. I'm, I'm gonna drop one more because when I end, I'm gonna drop it one more time. It violates the Eighth Amendment. It violates. Yeah, hold on. We have an adversarial system, right? It violates the confrontation clause. Why? Because if it doesn't allow a challenge, if it doesn't allow the confrontation, that's the burden they don't want because it's a preponderance of evidence. Not just, well, I said it because I thought he had said it and we working with the feds. Makes it illegal. The taking clause, you got to be duly compensated for that. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What if they take your car and that's your car that you go to work in? Now that puts your job in jeopardy. You now got to spend more money to get to and from work. Uh-oh. You probably have to buy another car. Uh-oh. Just cause. Not the country version, but just cause. I want you to let that sink in. Because even the Supreme Court recognized that such an argument is not inherently unreasonable. There is, in strength, in the con um, contention that civil forfeiture seems to violate that justice which should be the foundation of the due process of law required by the Constitution. Should be. But they're looking for ways to circumvent the process. Where do they mess up at first? Notification. Why? Because if you're not notified, you can't challenge. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. They must do that. Civil forfeiture deprives owners of procedural due process. Remember, I actually put up that list of procedural due process. I actually told you about that. We did a video on that. I want you to go back and watch that one. When applied to conduct beyond its historic scope. Now, I'm going to give you another case. Leonard v. Texas. All right? Little V. Texas was arguing that due process was required. It required Texas to prove its case by clear and convincing evidence rather than by a preponderance standard. Why? Why was that? Because, remember, they have a preponderance standard. Because there was no conviction. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. But here's the thing that I constantly say. The Supreme Court denied this request because Leonard had failed to previously raise her due process claim. I constantly tell you the foundation. I even showed you with the, with the attorneys that came on the show. They had never done a detailed discovery until I gave it, for, gave it to them for their case. Because if you don't ask for it, you can't bring it up later. I even gave you the code for Georgia. If you didn't ask for it, you can't bring it up later. 
This is why it's key to have an actual detailed discovery because if you don't ask, you can't bring it up on appeal, you can't bring it up in the lawsuit, you can't bring it up ever because it wasn't something that you started with. That's why piranha don't eat piranha. That's why whenever you see all these people getting out of jail, doing appeals, what's the thing that allows that? Ineffective assistance of counsel. Why? Because they didn't do a detailed discovery. Why? Because they didn't make a proper argument. Why? Because they did not make them prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Because they did not keep the argument that you are innocent until proven guilty. But I, I'm just like you. I'm going to do what you do. But when it's time to look the devil in the eye, you go get the attorney. You go get the, the fellow piranha. Knowing piranha don't eat piranha. Knowing the ineffective assistance. So you're not picking up a tool to destroy them with. You're picking up a tool to aid them. Because you don't believe what you're saying. Oh yeah, it's crickets in here. I want you to understand that. Because this was a tool that was used in the war on drugs in the 80s and ultimately expanded over to cover federal crimes. The property used to facilitate a crime, proceeds of an offense, or property traceable to those proceeds. Those were the things that was supposed to be taken. Why? Because that would add to just cause. Citations aren't crimes unless there's an injured party. Because uh, remember, Part of a crime and evidence in the, in the vehicle. Part of a crime and evidence in the vehicle. That was stopped justly. But that's where you would get the proceeds. That would you get to facilitate the crime. That's why they're always talking about bank robberies. Why? Because there are certain actions that's going to be present from a bank robbery in a getaway car. These are the things, because they'll, they'll disguise it as, oh, we were, we didn't search the car, we were itemizing. But then there are other tricks that you have to look for when you see that. Because it's not just the itemization, it's the understanding that, because even, even in the Young Thug case, Thug was allegedly caught with drugs and guns going on his way to the Buckhead Airport. Not the Buckhead, excuse me. The airport out in um, Peachtree City. Most people don't even know there's a private airport out there in Peachtree. Or, excuse me, on Buford Highway for, for those that are on Atlanta. But that stop was thrown out, even with the drugs, even with the guns. Why? Because a tent violation is not cause, just cause for a search. Uh-oh. 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 Because even having an illegal tent is not illegal. <laughs> Why? Why do I say that? Why, why do I say that, Richard? Why you shouldn't be saying Because the Supreme Court told me so. Because a cop's ability to see into your car has nothing to do with your ability to move it. Or operate it as they like to use. Because now, but I want you to understand something. Leonard v. Texas set the standard for defeating forfeitures. It recognized that civil forfeitures can become overly punitive. Uh-oh. Remember I told you about the Eighth Amendment. As such cases, certain constitutional protectors must be attached. The accountability of such protections depends on the proceeding. If it's criminal, civil, or administrative, And if there was notification, why? Because the confrontation clause, due process requires that the guilt of a criminal proceeding be proven beyond a reasonable doubt 
That is the exact same thing that must be done with the notification because someone must be confronted. When they're confronted, it must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Always understand that. You have an opportunity to fight. And I'm going to come back with this one and get deeper into it because I want you guys to understand there is a mean of getting your stuff back. There is a means of actually winning these cases. There is a means for you to go to the other side and get back what's rightfully yours because it was done unjustly, unconstitutionally, and against the law that they're supposed to uphold and defend. So be ready for it. Let's keep going. Let's keep growing. Hit me up. Contact me. My contact information is greatest now at Yahoo. I want you to understand this is different now. You have a means of fighting back and they can't just take something because they want it. Supreme, I'm out.